Alia. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Good, good. Thanks for joining us, Leah. Yeah. Hey, Cheryl, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Hello, everyone. Hello. How are you? I'm OK. Good to hear your voice. Yeah. Same here, Tyler. Do you have a good Mardi Gras? <laughs> I had a wonderful time. I really enjoyed myself. It was I a good one this year. It was beautiful. It was really, really beautiful. Yeah. We really needed it. Um, that and a few more like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have the French Quarter Fest coming up and Jazz Fest coming up. So. And the Treme Seven World Fest coming up. Yes. <laughs> Hopefully, anyway. Trying to pull it together. Yeah, the vaccine mandate is is canceled today. So. Returning to uh, normal, it's awesome. Yeah, that's what we get there. I wish more people would have gotten vaccinated, but I, I, I still can't understand that one. Yep. Yep. Puzzling many of us. Well, hopefully we'll have a few more folks join here. Um, We'll wait until maybe five after the hour. We've got three more they are coming in. We've got Dana, Haley, and John. Looks like they're still connecting. Hey, John, Dana, and Haley. Hello. Hey, guys. Good. 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 Hello, everyone. Hey, Sharon. So we're going to wait until the uh, five-minute mark to get started as a few more folks roll in. And Tyler, remind, <clears throat> we've got to remind everyone that the next meeting uh, we're, we're likely to be in person. Um, are, we, are we not subject to? Yeah, we're not subject to it because we're, we're, not, not, a, okay. we're not a border commission. This isn't a, re, you know, it's not a, a real sort of board. So, um, maybe, maybe so I think it's for this group to discuss, you know, yeah. I think, um, as much as I would like to see everyone's faces in person, I kind of wonder if um, participation would drop off um, just because everybody's kind of all over the place. But I think it's certainly worth the discussion. Yeah, and maybe we can find a location that's not, you know, here that would work better for everyone. Yeah, I mean, the plant is always available unless somebody would like to host that yeah. can, can accommodate a dozen or more people. Yep. Hey everyone, this is Dana. My mute was muted and I couldn't unmute it, but I'm good now. Hi Dana, nice to see you. Yeah, good to see you Dana. Well, it's 4.05, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started just so that we can you know, be respectful of everyone's time here at the end of the day. And um, uh, I think a few more folks will hopefully roll in. And I just wanna say real quickly for everyone's benefit, um, my car is not starting in the parking lot here. So there is a tow truck on the way. So I may have to dip out at some point and hand off the meeting. 
but um, hopefully they'll be late and I won't have to do that. But uh, just so you know, if you see me drop off, that's where I'm at. Um, so, you know, it's been a minute since we've met. Uh, I think, you know, obviously carnival, lots of things going on the last few months that just kind of, you know, too much going on. So, uh, so we, we kind of had to drop off for a couple of months, but we're happy to be back um, with y'all. And so generally just kind of wanted to give you an update because it's been a while and just sort of show you some of the stuff we've been working on and some of the things that are going on here, you know, hear from y'all, your reaction to some of those things. And maybe some, some things will come up too that can start to inform, you know, the next couple of meetings as we go through. Looks like Jane Malin is popping in too. So the, the real big news that we have going on here in the last month is that we um, got board approval for our five-year strategic plan. Um, so I know y'all, uh, I think two or three times, um, our consultants, Raftelis, um, met with you all to start to you know, present on the progress and, and get input on that process. So obviously we wanna thank y'all for your input. It was incredibly important to the process. And so we're really, really hitting the ground running with implementation now. Um, we do have printed copies that we're distributing to our, all of our employees and key stakeholders. So all of y'all should um, look out for those. As many of you, I have your addresses. There's a couple I don't. Um, so those of you that I don't, I'm probably going to follow up by email to make sure I can get your address. But all of you are also going to get a printed copy of the plan too, so that you can um, take a look at it and have it to reference as you need. Um, in terms of implementation, you know, one of the big things we're working on right now is developing an online dashboard um, so that we can start to actually develop metrics to measure our progress on accomplishing the, the plan's goals and then actually you know, show that off to groups like you, our board, and others um, so that we can actually demonstrate that we're making progress towards achieving our goals. And of the, the plan, you know, just moving ahead to the next slide, you can see that there are, as we had sort of previously discussed, there's these six major focus areas that we're looking at um, over the next five years. And so each of those focus areas has an implementation working group made up of, you know, eight to 10 of our staff across different levels and departments um, who are uh, meeting at a bare minimum quarterly, if not more. Um, so that we can begin to really push forward implementation of all of our goals and tactics um, and begin to show some pretty quick progress on some of these bigger ticket items. So um, we're really excited about this. A lot of the staff are really excited. I know the working groups are excited to, to get together and work. Um, so, you know, I just really wanted to share with you that I think that, um, you know, this plan is a great way to help tell our story. And you'll see that when you get your copy that there's the plan itself, um, you know, the, the strategy part of it is really what we're showing you here, this sort of two page spread of information, but the rest of the, the 37 other pages of the plan are really telling the story of who we are, how we got here um, and why things kind of are the way they are. And I know that, you know, a lot of y'all have come to understand that through the work that we're doing together in this group. But I think um, this will be really helpful for us as we continue to tell that story um, to the rest of the community and, and continue to have a conversation about that. So um, that's all I have now about the strategic plan. I was going to move on to the next thing unless anyone has any specific thoughts or feedback on that on the plan. How are we going to get copies to the board members? Or committee members uh, next time we meet maybe or uh... I, I was going to mail them I, you know we're we're basically putting together a list of like a hundred or so people you know elected officials people like that that we want to mail the plan to and so I've included all your names on that list um, like I said I, there's a couple of you I don't have addresses for and I'll reach out individually to get those but otherwise um, or if your address has changed since we started this please reach out and let me know so that I don't accidentally send it somewhere else. But um, yeah, we'll be mailing them because um, I do want to get them to you soon so that you have a chance to take a look at them and digest before the next meeting. Excellent. All right, the next real update is, um, you know, on our customer service side of things, obviously, you know, we're continuing to, to have a lot of the same issues that we've struggled with for a while um, in, in, um, in terms with um, meter reading and, and billing accuracy, a lot of that, as you know, we've talked about several times before, has to do with our meter reading process and capabilities. We're especially challenged right now, as you can see, um, we've only got about half the number of people that we need in that unit, um, just because of, you know, general issues with staffing that everybody's having right now, in addition to, you know, our general problems in that division with the fact that it, it the job just frankly 
is a crappy job. So, you know, it's a lot of bending, leaning, lifting, digging, you know, so it's just not, it's not a pleasant job. And we also find that as the weather, you know, like right now we're, we're doing really well in terms of reading, but once it gets hot, people will start to quit. Um, so, you know, as we've talked about a lot before, the ultimate solution to that problem is moving to our smart metering system. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a second, but, um, you know, so we're, we're trying to get back down in our, our call volume. As you can see here, the average wait time was up a bit because of our staffing shortages. We started to bring that back down. And so, um, you know, we, as, as always, we know that we're not um, exactly where we need to be in the customer service portion, but we are trying our best to get caught up at least so that we can continue to make improvements to serve our customers better. Tyler, are you able to, uh, do you have a timeline for when that automated meter reading will be implemented or is that a moving target? I th I've got a, it's like in two or three more slides, I've got more information on that one. So I'll get to you. Um, so the next uh, thing we just wanted to give a quick update on our financial, uh, you know, where we're at financially. Um, we've done a lot of work recently to focus on um, reducing those age receivables, those old accounts that are just sitting out there, money that's owed to us from, you know, a lot of times it's like a renter moves out, you know, we can't find them anymore. And so we have to end up writing that off. Um, we've really been aggressively trying to make sure that we can um, collect on those so that, you know, we're able to continue investing those funds in the system and making sure that we're able to continue to operate. So we are kind of getting back down to a normal level. Um, and those receivables that it received, it, it went up a lot, obviously with COVID and then again with Hurricane Ida and we're starting to come, come to, back down to a normal level. Um, the other thing we wanted to talk about a little bit today was the, um, the Infrastructure Act money. Obviously that's a huge, um, huge issue going on in the city right now, but especially for us. Um, and so the first thing on that point is that we are currently recruiting for a full-time employee that can just work on, you know, attracting those sources of revenue, grant applications and things like that, um, so that we can make sure that we're really positioning ourselves um, well to take advantage of those opportunities. And then furthermore, you know, just kind of giving a little more detail about what the Infrastructure Act um, looks like in terms of the opportunity for us. Um, you know, I think everyone's probably aware that there's, it's a, a total of $1.2 trillion um, over five years that the, the federal government is looking to spend. About $55 billion of that total is, is earmarked towards water projects. Um, obviously, you know, we want to be realistic in that we're not going to receive, you know, all of that. We're certainly not going to receive, you know, our entire need. Um, but we think that we're setting us up, us, ourselves up properly to receive a significant amount of resources from it. Um, we've gotten, you know, a lot more details recently from, from the federal government on how the programs are going to roll out. And so we know now that most of the water programs are going to come down through existing um, programs that exist, either through um, EPA itself, FEMA, um, or down at the state level through um, LDH or D, um, DEQ grant programs that we already participate in, like the state revolving loan funds. And so we're already familiar with those programs and already take advantage of those funds. The great thing about the, the way that it's gonna work with the Infrastructure Act um, is that many of those, those loans through those programs will end up eventually being either forgivable or will have much more favorable terms for us than they would uh, traditionally. So, you know, whereas now those programs are really favorable for us and that they have a much lower interest rate, much better repayment terms than, you know, a traditional bond would be, it'll be even more favorable now where there'll be extremely low interest or a much higher federal share um, than they would typically be because of the Federal Infrastructure Act money coming through those programs. So, yep. Is someone going to say something? Oh, I thought I heard someone. Maybe, maybe something might be worth mentioning is that that money uh, will be uh, funded over a course of five years. So this yeah. is not the one year, here, here's the money. So right. it will be prolonged over five years. And even by the federal agency's admission that, admission that this would be a drop in the bucket in terms of need. So they probably, we need tenfold as much money as they're offering to make a significant impact. Nonetheless, it's money that we didn't have a few months ago. So we're very happy that the potential is there. Yeah, totally. So it's, uh, I mean, in a lot of ways, it's really advantageous for us that they're going to be splitting the money up over five years, because in a lot of ways, 
we're not really ready yet to, to put out some projects that we know that we, um, sh we should be putting in the pool for that funding. Um, and so it gives us a little bit of time to get caught up to maybe some of our peers that are a little bit ahead of us in terms of planning and design on, on large scale projects. Um, so we're already thinking about how we can start to, you know, put forward um, design on projects that we know we want to try to put forward for funding in, you know, two, three, four, five years so that we can make sure that we don't miss this opportunity by getting those under design now and ready to put it into an application in, you know, years three, four, or five of the funding opportunities. So this slide just has kind of a little overview of like where all the different um, uh, funding sources will end up going within the existing programs. So you can see there's about an even split between um, clean water SRF and drinking water SRF. So clean water SRF is typically for um, sewerage and wastewater projects. Drinking water SRF is usually for you know um, water purification and water distribution projects. Um, cleaning water emerging contaminants is um, towards um, treating emerging um, pollutants of concern um, like PFAS, PFOA, um, things like that that are not currently regulated by the EPA, but the EPA will be looking to regulate in the near future. Um, and so that's something that, you know, we're obviously very interested in making sure that we can improve the standard of our uh, water treatment processes to address those future regulatory needs um, so that we, you know, can be ahead of the curve whenever those regulations do come out. Um, and then there's a drinking water lead program, uh, which will be um, for the replacement of lead service lines throughout the community. And so we're also um, working very hard to get kind of caught up on, um, on inventorying our lead service lines so that we can make sure that when those funds become available, we can get out in the community and start replacing those as soon as possible. And then, you know, so as I said, we've we've identified a ton of projects that we want to put forward for this. We've kind of started an internal task force between, you know, engineering and planning and, and the executive level to start to really identify how we're going to prioritize which projects we, we want to put through. Um, so far, we've identified about $850 million in eligible priority projects um, that we'd like to put forward for these sources. Um, again, you know, we're very optimistic that we can be very successful in, in attracting these funds. Do I think we're going to get $850 million? Probably not. Um, but even if we could get half of this, it would be a huge, huge, huge help um, for us in terms of, you know, bringing our system up to um, the kind of standards that it needs to be at. And so, you know, the types of projects that we're talking about are, you know, wastewater and water treatment plant replacements, you know, both our East Bank um, wastewater treatment plant and water treatment plant. Those of you who came um, to the water treatment plant were able to see with your own eyes how old and, and decrepit that plant is. It does a tremendous job of doing its job um, under current conditions, but it really does need to be replaced in the long term. Um, and so we think that this is a really great opportunity for us to be able to take advantage of a federal funding source to do that. As I mentioned, lead service line replacements throughout the community. Um, you know, the Biden administration has made it a huge priority to make sure that there's no more lead in public drinking water systems at all. Um, and so we are, are obviously going to be trying to prioritize getting out there and, and removing lead in the system as well. Um, there will also be funding available for expanded water distribution system funds, meaning that we can get out there and replace more water mains and, you know, water service lines so that, again, we can reduce the number of leaks in the system, make it more efficient, make it tighter, um, and reduce the number of boil water advisory and, and low pressure events that we have um, throughout the, the, the year. And then finally, um, there's certainly going to be some funding in there that we think that we can put towards the last funding gap that we have in our West Power Complex project. So that's procurement of, you know, the, the last turbine eight and turbine nine that we've talked about before um, and making sure that we have plenty of, of extra backup power generation load. We can totally, um, you know, decommission the existing power plant that we have now that's extremely inefficient and breaks down all the time um, and really transition into a sustainable, reliable, redundant um, source of self-generated power um, so that we can continue to operate all of our facilities during, you know, storm events and, and all, under any condition. So we think that this is, you know, if we can get funds for each of these projects, we'll be able to be in really good shape. So I'm going to stop there on the infrastructure act because I know that's a lot of information I just threw at you and see if you have any other questions or comments. I do, Tyler, and if you uh, mentioned this, just skip over because I need to have to step away for a second. No problem. Um, what is the timeline on the award here? And then what's the timeline on the spend? Is there any insight into that right now? 
Yeah, so we did mention um, that they're essentially allocate. they're splitting the funds up over five years. Um, in some cases, the funds are just evenly split amongst the years and some of them, the money, um, they're kind of like, I think the, the lead service line money won't start for, I think, two more years because they're waiting for utilities to do inventories and project planning um, before they want to start giving out the money. So it really depends on the program, um, but it's, it is a, all of the money essentially is supposed to be spent in the next five years, I have a feeling that we'll probably find that they'll extend the deadline yeah. on the, the spending, um, just because I think that just simply from like a capacity in the construction industry, I don't know if right. you know yeah, no, we'll I'm be able. To yeah, a construction timeline right now that would fit into that, and it would be hard. Uh, yeah, when you think about every community in the country, too, at the same time, trying to spend this amount of money, um, it would certainly be a huge demand on the construction industry. So I, I think that we'll probably see some extended um, deadlines on the spending, but that the awards will still roll out over the next five years in terms of identifying projects and getting them funded. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I have a quick question. Yeah. When you say we... Are you sewage and water board only, or is there like a concerted effort with the rest of the city, DPW? Like, how is, seems like all these kind of yeah. interlocked things is helpful for this. Funding. Great question. Yeah. So the mayor has essentially set up sort of like a regional task force that's looking at, you know, advocating on behalf of the city for all the projects. And so the list that we've created gets sent up to them, and then they send that project up to their contacts. I don't know if Kassan, you have any more information on how she's running that um, than I do. Yeah, the, the most traditional uh, method or uh, likelihood of us getting money would be on our own going to the state through the SRF, like uh, Tyler mentioned. The mayor is gonna play a role in finding new buckets of money that are kind of non-traditional and it's gonna advocate for, for the city um, so we're going to focus now, the 850 million are predominantly under SRF, more traditional uh, path for getting funding, which we have done in the past. So, so it's a mix, but the bulk of it will be on our own getting what we need for the utility. Yeah, so it's it's a it's an interesting case where there's um, I think a lot of utilities and cities are feeling like there's a need to do a lot of like lobbying or that there's like some sort of earmark system in place for these projects and it's really not the case it's there. I think it's actually very smart the way they're doing it because they're just using all these existing programs that uh, they're just, you know, normally in a normal year, and these are made up numbers, but you know the state of Louisiana might put out $20 million in um, drinking water SRF loans to local utilities, it's just going to mean that over the next five years, they might give out $200 million a year instead of $20 million a year. So we already take advantage of those programs. We already know how they work. We're, we're well versed in it. And so we're already advantaged over communities that don't typically use those programs and in, in our ability to attract those funds. And it just means that they can fund more projects, um, which is really great. I know, David, you added a link in the chat. Did you want to um, say anything about that? It's just that um, the Department of Energy, uh, you, you're absolutely right from what I've heard as far as people. So I'm working for the Department of Energy now. Uh, okay. I was at Interior. Yeah. And um, so the existing programs, like you're saying, are being plussed up in a big way with a lot of money. But the, you know, at least as far as the talking points that we're working with for energy is that it's for energy in particular, it's 60 new programs with so $62.5 billion um, to spend over the next four or five years. And uh, the this year one is a lot of planning, um, look for the, you know, RFIs and the NOIs are gonna follow. Um, but there are things like resilience planning for microgrids and communities and um, things like that as well. So yeah. there's uh, funding yeah. that's be coming out, but it's, it's after a year of stakeholder input so that they can, because like the others, unlike the others, DOE has to develop these programs from scratch. And so there's a lot of uh, planned stakeholder input in the beginning. That's and really that's great. Um, oh, go ahead, Gassan. 
that's where the mayor again will become more effective in terms of uh, kind of maybe have a unified application for the city as a whole and then folding us under that that ask with, with the new programs. But like yeah. I said before, we're, we're focusing on what we know for now and what they know, kind of to cement some money, you know, kind of secure that and then we'll explore other options and other alternatives later. Yeah, and I think that said, um, you know, David, if you see anything come across your desk that you think would be, be interesting to us, please just send it my way. Cause you know, like I said, we're very familiar with the FEMA and EPA sources, but if there are things at DOE that, you know, could could advantage us. It'd be good to know about that. Yeah. All right. Um, the next thing we wanted to talk about was just a little bit of our technology modernization projects. So um, very early stages, but we are currently working on um, replacing our financial system and our work order system. Um, obviously, as the work order system in particular um, replacement gets off the ground, I think it'll be important to discuss that more with this group. Um, since I know that a lot of you are probably pretty well versed in the 311 system and putting in work orders for us or calling about leaks or things like that. Um, and so we're hoping to um, work in coordination with the city so that we can perhaps um, unify our work order system so that we can better um, um, coordinate our work, you know, particularly in road work, but also just, you know, that way you don't have to say you call three and one and say there's a leak in the street and they say we don't do that you got to call the city or you got to call sewage you know that we can kind of unify our customer experience in terms of reporting issues um so we're really excited about that it's a long time coming the current work order system we use is over 30 years old and the company doesn't exist anymore whenever it stops working our it people have to develop solutions to keep it running so it's a long time overdue to um to get that uh, uh, underway. Um, and then, yeah, on the smart metering program, uh, so we did receive um, responses to our RFP um, about a month ago now. Um, that we received seven responses, which was really exciting. Um, we got responses from all of the major uh, manufacturers and, and um, um, all the leading you know, vendors that are out there. So that's, again, really exciting for us to see. Um, so, you know, we feel really confident that we're, there's a solution there that's going to work for us. Um, we really also are being optimistic that we think that we can really get, start getting meters in the ground by the fourth quarter of this year. Um, all of the installers seem to, to think that they are going to be able to, to meet that timeline. Um, some of them, you know, said it, they think it might take a little longer than others, but it seems like the consensus is that about, um, three years is the longest that it could take. Um, to get all of the meters in the system replaced. Um, but that, you know, some of them thought two years. So perhaps by the end of 2024, um, you know, we could have a fully um, smart meter system running um, and be getting all of all the meters online there. Um, but the nice thing is that all the systems that I've, I've looked at the responses for, um, they would all allow us to essentially, you know, phase it as, as we go through. So, you know, we can get do route by route and the first route that goes in the ground, it can get hooked online and, and be sending meter data that way. So, um, you know, it's not like we have to wait three years for, you know, the system to start working. There'll be some people who will, will have to wait three years, but some people it might be the end of this year. Um, so we're really excited about that project and um, are gonna be evaluating those proposals and selecting a vendor um, week after next. Um, so by the time we meet next time, we should be able to reveal um, which uh, smart meter vendor will be using and what the system characteristics will be. Um, and of course, this, this group, I think, will be also very involved in that project as, you know, there's going to be development of a customer portal where you can go online and, you know, view your usage and track and see if you have a leak and things like that. And so I think we're going to be very interested in, in hearing y'all's input on um, helping us design um, the customer tools that we're going to be putting forward to, to match the smart metering program. I did just see Cheryl, you put in the chat that you asked me to address the lead service line replacement initiative, um, where it is in the priority line. Um, so I guess you're asking like, is, is that a top priority for us? Is that, is that what you're asking in terms of, is it a? Yes, and I hate to be ignorant about it, but I didn't know that we had so many lead pipelines in the water system. So, yeah. you know, that's, 
So yes. typically, no, no, let me let me maybe yeah go ahead, Gasan. Right quickly, <clears throat> I think it's it's important to kind of describe the whole situation of lead. So the source of water does not have lead. The way we produce water does not have lead. The water distribution system does not have lead. The only presence of lead in the, in the underground is the lead service line, the, the service line that comes from the main to the house. And uh, just like any old city, uh, there are a tremendous amount of lead service lines that exist. And it's not unusual for cities or utilities not, not to have a in good inventory of where those and how many those are. So it is a top priority for us to identify the locations and the number of those um, and to replace them as, as much as fast as we can. Um, it's also very important to uh, also note that we treat the water in such a way to create a film inside the wall of the existing lead lines as to limit the leaching of lead into the water. It's a very effective way to limit corrosion and limit the exposure of lead. Having said all that, uh, we do test the water on periodic on regular basis. We uh, comply with EPA and um, we know that the, 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 the first line of defense really against uh, any lead exposure is to have a filter in your house at the, the most commonly used faucet. Um, what we're doing now is we're going to spend as much time and effort and available dollars to inventory what we have uh, in the ground and uh, develop a program for replacing it. It's gonna be years before all lead service lines are, are removed and replaced. <clears throat> We're also focusing on <clears throat> not only uh, taking the, the portion of the lead service line between the meter and the, the water main, but also focusing on replacing the private half, which is from the from the meter to the house. That's very crucial because replacing only one half does not really solve the issue. So we're, we're going to, using as much of the federal dollars that will be made available to us to replace the entire length of the service line uh, when, we, when we touch them. Currently, I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you because, but I think it's important to have a very good understanding of what's, what's happening and what will be happening. Currently, anytime we replace a water main, uh, we, and we are doing quite a bit of that under the joint infrastructure road to recovery, you know, the settlement money from FEMA with, the, with the collaboration with the city. Every time we replace the main, we're replacing every single lead line, lead, lead service line that we, we encounter. We replace it from the main to the meter which I, as I said, it's not a complete solution, but at least we're taking advantage of having a project there and taking those out of, out, out of the ground. Uh, <clears throat> we also take out any lead service lines that we encounter during maintenance activities um, where we're doing some, some work unrelated or related to water. And if we encounter it, we put it on a list and we, we make that a priority to remove it and replace it. Uh, <clears throat> and then the other uh, important note to share is that if a property owner comes to us and offer to replace their portion of the lead service line, we will make a commitment to replace ours at the same time. Uh, it, that has not happened at any you know, large scale, but it has happened where somebody wants to invest in their own uh, portion and then we will do the same on our end. So. Uh, this is a long range program, just like every, every other city. It's really not a year or two. This is many, many years worth of effort to get rid of the entire uh, inventory that we have. And at this point, we can't even tell you how many those are. So, but top priority for sure. It's an obligation uh, for us to address it and we will address it. So this is the perfect time with the fact that the federal government is not only mandated, but all, also funding that, that effort. So I hope that answers the question. It, it answers the question, but, um, and I appreciate the answer, um, 
those lead lines, are they throughout the city of New Orleans or are they specifically in, in um, disadvantaged neighborhoods that I saw mentioned earlier were part of the slides? We, we believe they're everywhere and they're connected to uh, houses that are older. <clears throat> and we, we believe that any house that was built or constructed uh, Tyler, correct me if I'm wrong, 1986 or, or earlier may have lead in there. Uh, we, we don't suspect there's a lot of lead in the probably 86 to maybe 60, but anything, any old house would likely to have a, a lead service line. Old, new, I mean, uh, disadvantaged community or, or richer community, they're all, they're all the same vintage. Yeah, it really has to do, sorry, Cheryl, go ahead. No, I was going to ask, does that include commercial properties also? It can, yeah. yeah. So it really has to do with the, the year that it was built. But then, mm -hmm. you know, there's also, there's many uh, other factors that go into it. You know, it could have been replaced somewhere on, along the line. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for instance, my house, you know, is, you know, 125 years old. But, you know, when I put in new plumbing in the house, I replaced the lead service line. So, you know, we know for sure that mine's good. Um, but, you know, there's plenty of cases where, you know, properties have been re renovated over the years. And so that's one of the, the first steps that we need to do is do an inventory so that we know right. where we think they are, because we can't just go out and just start digging up every single line in the world and replacing them no matter what material they are. Um, and one aspect of that that's, that's crucial is that the new re requirements at EPA require that we have a public interface where people can go online and view the likelihood that their service line is led. So we don't necessarily have to say you definitely do or you definitely don't, but we we do have to say we think you have led or we don't think you do based on you know whether we have, you know, we know that you renovated your house in this year and the records show that we replaced your service line. So we can tell you you don't have one. Or we can say, you know, your house was built at, you know, in the 80s. So it could be, it could not be, we're not sure. So you may have a lead service line. Let's check it out once it gets up there and the, the level of priority. Or you have a portion of a lead service. You could have a portion, right. So it's going to be extremely complicated, but we're, we will hopefully have that public tool um, online in the next year or so. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, we'll be coming back to this group as well to get input on that as we um, begin to develop it. So will that be um, um, by way of like a GS, GIS map? Okay. You got it. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. Dana, you got your, your hand raised? I know I'm trying all the technology today. Um, <laughs> uh, do with that interactive um, portal also give people like you an opportunity to self-report like I know that this is that that lead line has been replaced so would that be a way of collecting data as well uh, that is not that is not a, fe a feature that I think it has now but I that is an excellent idea so right. I will certainly note that down for our next meeting with the developers um, so we're not quite there yet in terms of um, ready to announce but we are um, working with a known organization that actually did um, the assessment in Flint um, to do use machine learning to um, assess and inventory lead service lines. Um, and so we're really excited about that. It's being um, supported through some philanthropic funds um, and it's a really cool um, process and tool. So we'll, we're excited to, to um, get started on that. And hopefully, like I said, we can share more about that in the near future. And, but that's a great um, feature idea that I, I think is probably uh, very doable. So I'm gonna just keep rolling along here. Um, I'm gonna bring in, we have Grace Vogel now from our environmental affairs group, and she's gonna give you just a quick little um, update on a green infrastructure project that we have going on in um, Mid City. Thanks, Tyler. Thanks for inviting me to, um spotlight our latest project. So this comes in a line of projects, the uh, last of nine that stem from the consent decree funding um, dating back to 2014, where we dedicated $2.5 million to 
implementing, demonstrating, and educating about uh, green infrastructure and how it can help our stormwater management um, and stormwater runoff quality. So this project, um, as you can see, is located in Mid-City, right on Bayou St. John, um, on Moss and Orleans. Um, thank you. So uh, Dana Brown and Associates uh, won the bid for this project back in 2020. Um, part of the land of this project was city owned. So we worked with them with a, a CEA agreement so that we could um, use the whole, whole lot um, to do this. Um, currently they are in 75% construction drawings. This is the last um, graphic from the schematic design, but uh, it still is very close to what will um, end up being there. So. The goal of this was to demonstrate five different types of GI uh, green infrastructure and how they um, could work similarly or together and how they influence that stormwater runoff quality. So there'll be testing water quality as well off of these um, um, facilities. Um, let's see, let's go to the next one. It might have a little more updated um, layout. The next three are within their latest construction drawing set. And it shows um, a better layout of what the trees will be. Oh, I did not have it. Oh, <laughs> that's okay. Um, we can see from there. So that front arc that comes in and curves, those are the uh, four different types of GI. The first one um, being permeable pavers and then a, um, a tree cell section and then a bioretention section. So um, water runoff will come off from the street and filter into there as well as rainwater. And then they will lead into a um, detention overflow area where it can um, retain until it overflows into the, the culverts. And there's two lar very large culverts running underneath this site, which was one of the main reasons we wanted to take advantage of turning it into a outdoor park recreational area and green infrastructure site since it is um, kind of delicate and the ground was not um, was not made to be parked on or driven over. So um, this is a great spot to um, for us to demonstrate that. And then the blue that you see is going to be the, the, the most of the detention area. So rainwater will come kind of off the bur natural berm along moss. And then also there's at that letter A, you can see there's gonna be a curb cut along Orleans where the rain will come in underneath the sidewalk and enter that area. Um, and then at about B, it goes into a pipe that will feed into the GI facilities. And um, they can test from each one of them to see which one you know will filter the best or um, filter it the, the fastest. And um, let's see, we're 75% construction drawing. We're waiting for a price set from the um, contractor, which is RCI, I believe. And we're hoping to break, break ground in June after Bayou Boogaloo. We're working very closely with the Bayou St. John neighborhood and making sure that we're in line and coordinating with all of their neighborhood um, activities. We just had a uh, our second public workshop at the farmer's market down the street on uh, the Lafitte Greenway. It went very well. Um, got to talk to a lot of people and raise some awareness to it. Um, and there's a couple of uh, signage, a couple of pieces of signage on the site at Orleans that um, people can see as they drive by as well. Thanks, Grace. I know um, we also had that event last week. Was it last week at the or week yeah. before at the yeah. Crescent City Farmers Market? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was a great. Um, I, saw, I heard that it went really well. Yeah. Any questions for Grace? Awesome. I'm really excited about this project. I think it's going to be really cool and it's very high profile. So that's exciting. I did want to I do want to mention too, the one little note I forgot. I wanted to um, note that there is three years of maintenance included on this contract. So we've already, you know, learned our lesson and, and thought forward. Um, Dana Brown has, I don't know if she's secured a contract with somebody, but I'm pretty sure she's going to use Groundworks. And um, for three years after construction completion, um, they'll be doing the water um, quality testing and they'll be man maintaining the site as well. That's awesome. Thanks, Grace. Mm -hmm. All right, just two more quick updates for us today, and then we can just kind of chit chat about um, next steps with the group and, and other updates that any of you will want to talk about. Um, 
right now we're in pretty good shape in terms of pumping and drainage going into our spring rainy season. Um, there are just three pumps out of the 99 out, um, but they're all at stations with plenty of pumping capacity. There's just a little bit of redundancy that's down right now, but all of them should be back up, um, but back up and running soon. And then finally on the power, um, you know, we're, we're in pretty good shape right now. Turbine one is, is not um, currently functioning, but, um, and turbine three has, has officially been decommissioned. So uh, we're no longer using it at all. Otherwise we still have turbine four, five, six, and our EMDs available um, for use. And so we're, we're in pretty good shape going into uh, the rainy season. And that's all the slides I have. So um, I know I wanted to just kind of quickly ask, you know, any questions, thoughts, um, responses, also any updates that maybe any of you have that you want to share with us. Uh, Tyler, I've got two. One's a question and one's an update that I want to share with y'all. Um, the, the, I'll just the, put the link for the event. We've got an event coming up this um, um, Thursday at 8 a.m. It's virtual and that's the link to register. Um, it's it's on equitable infrastructure and I know that that term is floating around a lot right now and that's part of the reason that we want to have this and kind of dig into facets of of what exactly we mean when we say that because it means different things in different contexts. So we've got Amy Stelly talking about the Claiborne, her work with the um, Claiborne Expressway uh, or Claiborne Overpass. Um, and then Elisa Speranza will be talking about stormwater management fees and kind of where we are with that right now. And then uh, Nicole Nixon of Ubuntu uh, will be talking about some of the challenges she's encountered uh, with uh, their company has encountered with the procurement process. So kind of just looking at sort of some of these systemic um, issues and um, just having a full conversation. So I hope you can all join us. We've, it's a lot of interest. We've got like about 50 people have already registered for it. So we've like got space for some more. Um, to join us as well. And um, kind of related to that, um, I to, to Lisa's uh, topic anyway, um, I wanted to get your thoughts and feedback on um, Helena Moreno's press release um, regarding the um, basically um, joining Sewage and Water Board DPW um, to, to address drainage and what your thoughts are about the where that may be heading? Yeah, so Ghassan and I had a chance to talk about this a little bit this afternoon when the when it came out. Um, so those of you that haven't seen it, Helena Moreno put out a press release that they're, the council is gonna consider um, a motion to uh, create some kind of working group to look at the idea of joining the drainage system under a single entity. Um, it, it, of course, um, builds off of work that's that's been going on for quite a while. Um, and suggested that, you know, consolidating the drainage system under the sewage and water board, meaning the catch basins and the lateral lines that currently belong to the city um, would come under the control of the sewage and water board. Um, and so, you know, I think we're interested in the conversation. Um, we don't really know. Um, it doesn't seem like they're compelling us to do anything right now. It's really just sort of setting up a formal dialogue um, to discuss the process or what it, what it might look like. Um, I think, you know, Ghassan may want to jump in, but I know our position has always been that, you know, we're happy to, to take on the other portions of the system, but we are not going to do it um, without the appropriate funding in order to take it on. Um, so we don't want to be set up for failure. Um, and so that's just kind of where it's at right now. I think we're just going to kind of keep an eye on it. And of course, we'll participate in any process that, um, that they want to set up around that conversation. Okay, thanks. I'm just going to stick that link to it right here for anybody. Yeah, and thanks for that. sharing um, mm -hmm. also your, your event. That sounds really interesting. I'll have to definitely tune in. Yeah, hope you can. BYO Coffee. Yeah. Any other uh, shares or questions burning right now? Um, well, Tyler, you know WaterWise is interested in restarting the tours of yes, the yes. Um, plant station. So I just wanted to make sure that you were really aware of, yeah, of yeah, one Jeff, of the tours we would like to reincorporate. Yep, yep Jeff said he was going to get us a couple dates. And then, you know, we told him wh whatever dates y'all want to do, we'll, we'll figure it out. So okay. we got you. Okay, good. 
I just wanted to plug an event too. Um, I set up a catch basin cleanup with City Park next um, Tuesday, the 29th. And um, I'm, you know, trying to lure as many Sujuana board employees to come out and do it. It's from 9 a.m. to 12, but it's also a public event because more the merrier. So I'm gonna pop the uh, the registration link in the in the chat as well. Please send it to anybody who might be um, available and interested that day. Awesome, thanks, Grace. So, um, I have oh, go ahead. I'm two sorry. questions. Oh, but go ahead. Go ahead, I, David. Oh, sorry. I, I was wondering about the um, the green infrastructure. You know, you said that there's a couple of years of maintenance uh, included in the contract. Is there ongoing education about those things? Is is planned as well, right? That's not, you know, a teaching moment that lasts for a couple of years and then everybody forgets what it is or why it's there and. Oh, for those, yeah. So um, okay. we currently also have two other sites that I give tours of. Um, mostly, I you know um, interact with college classes that are you know it's involved in theirs or. So that's or part student. of your ongoing your ongoing duties, okay? Yeah. So outreach is is definitely ongoing. I don't I don't okay. see that ever coming to an end, regardless of the consent decree. And we're always doing a lot of outreach um, under our our stormwater permit. And regardless if it's about you know water quality or green infrastructure or you know whatever type of stormwater management will continue to do that kind of outreach. I think there are also some uh, significant um, workforce development uh, provisions. So not only was there the infrastructure bill, but the omnibus uh, appropriations just passed. So, and then if Build Back Better happens in tranches or together, but are, are you guys um, following any workforce development for, do you have any specific new workforce development needs or things for sewers and water board as far as um green infrastructure i can say that um i'm i follow along with um the grd uh project that is the workforce development that they are working on um to take care of all of those large resiliency projects from that funding as well um right now we just do it in-house to contract out which is similar to what the city would do um we would like to think at some point in the future we could facilitate that in-house and have a crew that we train and um you know and have enough projects that they would have a full schedule of, of things to maintain and things to work on and um Right now we would have three to four um, locations where they, they could do that maintenance. So it's for, certainly um, plausible, but it's all just based on funding. And then also that, again, working up to that, who's trained and who's willing to take those jobs and really start that program. So it's one step at a time, but everybody's everybody's talking to everybody as it goes along for sure. And um, also working with the Center for Watershed Protection and their program for that training, I think is also taking a, a bits and pieces from everybody and making sure everybody's getting the same training. It's very similar related to the NGICP training. Um, so we're all working together one step at a time, but currently we still are contracting out. So I did just want to phrase, um, Dana asked about um, some outreach at a, uh, for a summer camp. And I, Grace, I said that you should, you could be the point of contact for, for her on, on having, you know, maybe you can come out and talk to those kiddos about the uh, pumping system. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. I do uh, just want to kind of quickly talk about, the, it kind of came up before several of you joined at the beginning, um, but Gassan did mention um, you know, with the governor's emergency declaration expiring, um, our official board is no longer allowed to meet virtually. Um, since this board is not, you know, like an official um, board of commission, according to the state, we we aren't subject to that requirement. Um, so we we are allowed to continue to work, to meet virtually if we want to. Um, but I did just want to kind of it's a moment to bring that up to the group that if they're is a strong desire to start meeting in person, I'm happy to find a way to make that work. Um, but I also think, you know, I, I suspect that it's probably easier for a lot of you um, to tune in when you don't have to physically go to a place. So I guess I just kind of wanted to do a quick poll of the group and see if anyone feels strongly about continuing virtual or strongly about meeting in person. Um, and it, you know, then we can kind of go from there in terms of how we wanna move forward. I'm so torn that which I guess means I don't feel strongly about either okay. one or else I feel really strongly <laughs> about both. But yeah, there are definite 
advantages to eat both. So. Right. May, may, may I say just that we will do a hybrid, maybe two virtual and one in person, so we can at least satisfy both and then continue to at least get together once in a while. Would that something that you want to consider? Yeah, I think just that's a way. Idea. Yeah, maybe, maybe we can just go ahead and say, um, you know, like maybe next month we'll do in person, but just give a call in option um, for those that maybe aren't comfortable or, or, don't, or aren't able to make it in person and just see how that works um, and go from there. Yeah, Great. I think hi, hi, yeah, a hybrid doesn't work. What I meant by hybrid is we would do two in two virtual meetings and one in person where we would encourage everyone to attend in person that he would be more effective. I got gotcha. you. At least we can get together once in a while versus every month. I see. You're talking about staggering it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Staggering it two two and one instead of one and one. Yep. Okay. Just as a um, thought, as it just as something to throw out. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I guess Gasan, real quick, while I, I do still have you, um, did you want to talk a little bit about um, what you want to discuss at the next meeting? I know we were talking about that a little bit before everyone else joined. Well, I know there was an interest in talking about customer service and issues and opportunities and successes. And because Elaine was one of the, uh, I guess, main requester of that topic and she couldn't join us today, we really intentionally didn't talk about it today. But I wonder if, if there's interest to have it to be the, the dominant, I guess, sort of the, uh, the item to discuss at length next meeting. If there's a, otherwise we can spend some time alone with Elaine uh, if, if there's no interest or general interest from the, from the rest of the committee. I feel like that would be a great topic for an in-person meeting. Yeah. Okay. I, I think so. Um, yeah. So I think that's a great idea that we can do um, an in-person next time. And I'm seeing David, your um, your suggestion for periodic tours and site visits, which is also very well taken. I think Grace um, Birch was just texting me saying we got to get y'all up to see a drainage pump pumping station. And I know there's also a desire to get you to the the wastewater treatment plant at some point as well. So. I certainly think um, now would have been, it's a beautiful day out today. Today would have been a great day, but um, certainly I think over the year we can get you out to some facilities because um, I, I agree that the water um, treatment plant tour, I think was a really great opportunity to see all of y'all and show off our facility. All right, well, um, I'm gonna do a last call for any comments or questions, um, but otherwise I'm gonna do take my orders and say, we'll do the next meeting in person. Um, we're gonna be talking about billing and customer service issues. We'll, we'll be sure to have some of those staff on hand um, with us so that we can really dig in deep on that issue. Um, and then Grace and I will take our, our orders too and start thinking about tours and um, putting together maybe a more regular drumbeat of meetings that are somewhat, some in person, some virtual. All right, thanks y'all. Great and to see you. Send a notice out a little earlier, Tyler. I will do. I hear you, Cheryl. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Good seeing everyone. Bye. 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 See ya.